I like this better. Can you hear me? This is such a serious room. It's pretty amazing. Uh, greetings. I am Tim DeNoble. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for the AEC, that would be Architecture, Engineering, Construction Lecture Series. Um, I am uh, representing today uh, our college, but uh, this is a collaboration between the uh, Departments of Architecture and uh, Departments of um, uh, Arch Engineering Construction Science. And Ray Yunk is here uh, representing uh, uh, the Department of Architecture, Engineering, Construction Science, and the College of Engineering. So we have uh, um, both colleges residing right here in the nexus of design and construction uh, sponsoring this great talk. So I'm very excited. This is probably, I don't know, we've had maybe four of these lectures over the uh, 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 number five, yeah. So this is our fifth lecture. We've done these uh, over time. We've had some uh, pretty amazing uh, talks in the past, and I'm sure that uh, John Ar Jonathan Arnold's uh, lecture will be the same. So let me tell you a little bit about our, our speaker. Jonathan Arnold is president and CEO of Arnold Development Group, where he's responsible for strategy, corporate vision, and capital structure. He's also the founder of Arnold Imaging, uh, his first business, and is the CEO of the nonprofit organization The Future The Way We Want The Future We Want, excuse me. He holds a degree in architecture from Cornell University, that's in Ithaca, New York, and a master's degree in real estate development from Columbia University, that's in the other Manhattan. Not the one on the one on an island surrounded by water, not by grass. Um, with his background in architecture and real estate finance, Jonathan launched the ADG, or Arnold Development Group, in 1998 with a sole focus of creating pedestrian-friendly places to work, live, learn, and play. The firm has successfully worked with communities in joint venture partnerships to design, entitle, market, and manage smart growth real estate. Uh, tonight, he'll share with us his largest and most impactful development to date, I believe. Very exciting. Now, let's step back a minute and talk about Arnold Imaging. And I think this is a great lesson for a lot of folks about the quality of uh, visualization. Arnold Imaging offers consulting services that make developing real estate more efficient. Their team of 3D artists and programmers specializes in visualizing sustainability solutions for the built environment. Founded on the principle that visualization is a powerful catalyst for positive change, Arnold Imaging blends the art of storytelling with computer-generated imagery to paint vivid, emotionally compelling pictures of sustainable lifestyles before they exist. Heck, they're so good, they may never need to exist, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> now, I've lost my place. Since their founding in 98, the company has helped launch more than $6 billion in smart growth developments in commercial real estate, including more than 40 continuing care retirement communities, 2,500 apartment units, and more than two dozen large-scale mixed-use urban infill developments. They've also worked with such powerhouses as the American Museum of Natural History, General Electric, and the New York City Housing Authority. So, obviously, you're starting to see that uh, Jonathan Arnold is, uh, is an active person. There's two companies I talked about. But there's also the Future We Want, a nonprofit organization aimed at rallying support for building a clean energy environment. The project is backed by the nation's leaders in sustainable design and include an eco literacy program for schools, IMAX film, public engagement tools, and a green marketplace geared to taking the stress and hassle out of greening your home. They also have uh, made presentations at the United Nations. So I first met Jonathan at a lunch, was it earlier, earlier last year, late last year, with Jonathan Kemper of uh, Commerce Bank. And so Mr. Kemper had arranged the meeting because he wanted me to meet, um, and this is to quote, one of the most forward thinkers I've met in quite some time. I think you will agree, and I think you will agree as well. In our meeting, I witnessed his integrated thinking regarding design, visualization, 
financing, construction, living, and lifestyle. Life cycle, making him a perfect fit to talk to those of us in the design and construction industries. So please help me welcome Jonathan Arnold. All right, can everyone hear me in the back? Great. Well, thank you for having me, Tim. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and I thought what I would do, I have a presentation that I'm going to go through which talks about the world's largest passive house that we are building right now. Um, but just in case some of you are saying, like, oh, that was a pretty long list of accomplishments. Um, there must be something unique about this person. Um, I'd like to dispel that myth and tell a little bit about my story, because obviously you guys are beginning your journey. And I think I would do a disservice if I came up and I just presented a lot of slides and left you with, wow, how did he get there? So um, I think I need to go back and start with my father. So my father's a doctor. I, I knew I did not want to be a doctor. I was terrible at biology. Uh, I actually didn't like to read when I was in high school. I liked to build things. Um, but my father decided very early on to uh, not become a typical doctor, instead become an epidemiologist. What an epidemiologist does is studies epidemics, looks at data and statistics, and looks to solve really massive problems. So the problem that my father took on was cigarette smoking. And at the time, about half of our population smoked, and he spent most of my formative years fighting the cigarette companies. And at first I thought, he's getting nowhere. Um, everyone's smoking, no one's decreasing. Um, this is hopeless. And then as I got into high school, I started realizing say, Surgeon General is putting labels on uh, cigarette packages. Less people are smoking. Got into college and realized the general consensus is this is pretty idiotic. And he made a really massive impact. So I went to Cornell, and I applied. Uh, literally, when I applied, they asked you this question, what's the most meaningful book you've ever read? And at the time, I answered truthfully, uh, Time Life series on home improvement. Um, I read it cover to cover. I think there's about 25 volumes that my dad bought. Why? I guess maybe he wasn't that good with a hammer and decided I need some help. Um, and about the same time, I think it was on a spring break, I was watching an infomercial, uh, probably like 1 o'clock in the morning, and Tony Robbins, I don't know if you remember this guy, he's a kind of motivational guy, um, he uh, bought his tapes and listened to them. And one of the things he talked about was we grossly underestimate what we can accomplish in a few decades, and we overestimate what we can accomplish in a year or two. And so he sort of set this picture in my mind that let's not make plans that are one year, two years. Let's think a little bigger like my dad. And Cornell had a great program where you could go to uh, Europe and study abroad. And I got to go to Rome and live there for a semester. And every day I would wake up and my morning routine was I would pass Vincenzo who is an artist, has great white hair, blue eyes, and in my limited Italian, I would listen to him talk passionately about his artwork. And about 10 steps on my way to Cornell, their uh, palazzo, I'd pass the baker, and I'd get my breakfast, and I'd meet him. And I'd pass the florist, and I'd say hi, and I'd get coffee at a little coffee shop, go to school, Kind of at lunch, I'd go back through that same piazza. And it had transformed from a marketplace into a vibrant place where people are having lunch. And then in the afternoon, all the kids would show up, and that's where they played soccer. So pretty quickly, uh, I got bitten by the urban bug. Um, but at the same time, I stayed. Uh, for the next semester, because my parents said, don't come home, learn the language, and I got a job on a farm and got frostbite on my nose. 
And so when you're in Europe and you get frostbite, uh, you go to a warm place. So I went to Africa. And um, <clears throat> so I went to South Africa, and I discovered the opposite of good urban living. And I got to do some relief work in shanty towns, and I said, this is, this is crazy. You know, we have millions of people in one city that are living with no roof. In the wet season, the water comes from above. In the dry season, sewage comes from below. And I left there and I said, I'm going to one of the, one of the two best architecture programs uh, in the country, K-State being the other, of course. Um, and I want to I, I want to address this problem, but you know I, I I felt that architecture wasn't quite enough to to get there. I just had that that sense that there was more to it um, to the solution. So I went back and uh, finished up Cornell and chose to work in a firm in New York City that focused on housing and schools because I figured that's a good place to start. Got to get experience. Um, and I only lasted seven months in architecture school, or architecture practice. And the reason being is I quickly found out that no matter what school we were designing or what housing project we were designing, uh, my boss would come in and he would redline the drawings until it looked like a prison. And I'd say, well, what happened to the design? I mean, we had all this great stuff. We had aesthetics. You know, we all learned from Steve Jobs that design matters, but not to someone that my boss was meeting with. So I said, I, I think I need to understand how this industry works. And that's why I started Arnold Imaging. Um, my mom practically had a coronary. Uh, but my dad told me, he said, if you have a plan, I support you. And so I, I didn't really have a plan at the time. Um, I just had an idea that if I founded an animation company, I could understand who are the players. And so museums became a client. Uh, developers became clients. Found out it was the developers that call the shots. That's who the architect was meeting with, redlining those drawings. Um, so I went back to school and got a master's degree in real estate development, which is basically an MBA. Uh, it's a year and a half program. And they arm you with enough knowledge to be quite dangerous. Um, <clears throat> So just as I was starting that program, I met my wife uh, to be in New York. And on our third date, she said, this may be going somewhere. Um, so I feel I have to tell you, I just took a job in Kansas City. And she moved out here. I finished up grad school. And um, when I finished up grad school, I said, OK, I know that I'd like to, I'd like to get back to those shanty towns at some point and do something uh, really meaningful and impactful. Um, but no one's going to say, Jonathan, you just graduated with a degree. So here, go build a city. Um, so I literally penned out what ended up being a 27-year plan. So I said, you have to start somewhere. And you want to pick a project size that is big enough to be meaningful. You can learn things. But not too big that if you make a mistake, you'll lose a lot of someone else's money. Um, so I decided 20,000 square feet would be a good uh, size to pick. So I gave myself three years to do that. And then I said, after we did that, we could probably double the size to do a 40,000 square foot project. And then after that, we could do an 80. And then after that, we could do two blocks. And if we didn't mess up the two blocks, someone would allow us to do five. And then I think we'd be ready to go back maybe to South Africa or somewhere else and help them. So while all that was going on, um, a couple of really fascinating demographic changes started taking place. So in the 90s, when people were talking about walkability and urbanity, um, it was largely a minority of people that were talking about this. And, but demographers 
all the way from Urban Land Institute to Robert Charles Lesser and Company to uh, the ULI, have all done research studies that have come to the same conclusion, which is basically that suburban expansion has ended in this country. And for the next 30 years, what you all will be working on, the dominant form of development, will be mixed-use, walkable, urban. Um, and this is largely being driven by a couple factors. The first factor is we're having a lot less households with kids. So in 1960, 48% of our households had children, and we all know what happened after that. We built ring after ring after ring of suburbs. And, but by 2030, that number is dropping to 27%. At the same time, for the first time in America, 75% of people, when asked, say, we'd like to live in a place where we could walk. This really is a game changer for someone who's interested in the environment, social connectivity, health, all of this, because you're no longer fighting, trying to get people to want to do the right thing, but you have all these people that are wanting something that we don't yet have. So the third line here goes down to, how does this new demand stack up to our supply? So all of you that are in the building and architectural trades are looking at what type of work am I gonna be possibly able to do? What's the demand gonna be? And what the demographers have come to the conclusion is that by 2020, we'll have 27 million large lot single family houses that largely there won't be a demand for. This is on the periphery of most of our metropolitan areas. And the reason is because millennials are saying, we'd like to live in a place that's connected, that I can walk, I can take transit. Um, I wanna stay in the city. And boomers are saying, I need to downsize and get out of my big house. And Gen X, we're pretty small. So we can't backfill it. So it's bad news if you own any property in the periphery and you're not planning on selling it anytime soon. Um, but the good news is that for urbanites and developers like our company is that there is a pent up demand for 45 million new housing units in walkable urban neighborhoods. I mean, that's, that's like the same type of demand after the war that happened. Um, so another thing that's driving this is obviously energy consumption, climate change, and utility costs are all working to put more wind behind this desire to be in a walkable place. This is uh, Jonathan Rose's research on location efficiency. And if you look at the far left, the 240 million BTUs per year is conventional suburban development, single family detached, not green. And if you go all the way over to the right, transit oriented development that is green uses one quarter of the energy. But it's not only energy, it's also time, because it takes time to burn that fuel. And so millennials and boomers and people are realizing time is the one commodity or one thing in my life that I can't manufacture anymore. And so I can have a richer life, like the one I experienced in Rome, where within one 15 minute period, I have all these rich experiences that I'm that are really making life full and good and interesting, socially connected. We're realizing that living in the suburbs isn't all that it's cracked up to be because we're largely, you know, I kind of likened it to training for death. You know, we ride around in boxes all alone. Um, so there's another thing that's driving this, which is people are buying less and renting more. So when people are buying, they listen to their banker, and their banker says, drive till you qualify, which means I don't care about your transportation costs. I'm only looking at your household expenditures, like your mortgage payment, and your income. So if you have to spend all this money on gas, and it's taking you another three hours a day to drive home to and from work, I don't care, but as people rent more, they're looking at their own pocketbook and saying, I don't wanna spend that much on gas. I don't wanna spend all this time in my car. So as a development company, we're looking to decide where are we gonna develop 
we're saying we want to develop right in the center because it's the most affordable place to live if you look at your total cost, both housing and transportation. Um, another key to success for creating walkable neighborhoods, if that's what people want to live in, they have to have something to walk to. So it doesn't work if you just have two or three buildings and there's not enough people living in those buildings to support the restaurants, the coffee shops, the dry cleaner, the pet store. I mean, all of the things that people want to walk to, if you have to get in your car, it's not really walkable. So instead of just thinking about individual buildings, we really need to be thinking about complete neighborhoods, like that place in Rome. And you have it all right together. And so developers, it's typically too large a task to do all of this yourself if you're a development company. So you need to start collaborating with other developers so that you start planning out, you do the grocery store, we'll do the dry cleaner. Maybe you don't even need a dry cleaner. Um, we'll do the uh, pharmacy. So with 45 million housing units need to be built, we ask this simple question, how should we build them? Should we import the, call it dirigible or disposable technologies of the suburbs? And let me remind you that the reason why suburbs were built to only last 15 or so years is because every seven years was how long it took for the next ring to be built. And the people that were financing these, especially the malls and office buildings, said, we don't know how long this neighborhood is gonna have any value, so let's not put a lot of money into it. And after seven years, we might pour money, more money into it and rebuild it. But there's a couple problems with stick-built wood frame uh, construction. One is all the walls are load-bearing. So if you want to change the use, and if you come across that book, you know, how buildings learn, you know, buildings have long lifespans, and we change the use. You might have residential on the ground floor in the beginning, and then five, ten years you put in a restaurant or an urgent care clinic. Um, they also are really poorly insulated oftentimes, and OSB is just glue and wood chips. And it's only a matter of time before water gets through the Tyvek that is never really properly put in. And then you have rot and mold. And in 10, 15 years, you're stripping the facades off these buildings and putting more money into them. So we went looking for a better model. And Ecclesiastes says there's no new idea under the sun. Um, we're kind of a believer in that. You'll see a lot of our stuff is uh, borrowing from the past and combining best practices. Uh, this is the Hotel Bell Nord. It's in the Upper West Side in New York City. Um, real estate developers at the time were faced with some of a similar challenge that we have right now, which is at the time that these buildings were built, if you had any money, you lived in a brownstone. And if you didn't, you lived in an apartment, which we've all remember architecture history class. Tenements weren't really great places to live. So developers said, let's build a new kind of apartment building that is luxurious, it's desirable, people will want to be there, we'll make them large, um, spacious, so that we get more out of our land, is really what they were going for. Um, but what they ended up creating was this incredible courtyard space in the middle of it. And <clears throat> the street, uh, with the streetcar is Broadway, and as you go down the side street and you look into that arch, you hear birds chirping, and you see green space. And it's this oasis in the middle of the great hustle and bustle of New York City. Um, and so you have this, what Jane Jacobs calls defensible space. It's uh, a best practice in urban planning. And this is not a new idea. If you look at Barcelona, um, this is a model that just works really well. You have uh, a great public realm that is density, you have shops that you can walk to. You have this semi-public realm in the courtyard. So if you have children in an urban area, you can let them out in this area, and you don't have to worry about them getting uh, run over or stolen. Um, and it holds its value. This is some of the most valuable real estate in the world. And this building's uh, approximately 100 years old. Um, so we built the company now around these four principles. That one, we don't think that building high performance assets that use less energy 
should mean that you have a lower financial return. There's a big debate going on in this right now of if you're going to do the right thing, do you have to have a lower return? And what we found is that if you combine lean construction, which we'll get into a little bit in a second, with good design, that you can actually have a higher return and a longer lasting asset that produces these other two bottom lines, namely positive impacts on the environment and positive impacts on the communities in which we develop in. So we've chosen to build our buildings out of concrete because they last a long time. The Pantheon's 2,000 years old, and it has a big hole in the roof. Um, we've landed on Passive House as the best practice and certification standard for energy efficiency because it really focuses on minimizing the load first as opposed to really complex, complicated, high-cost solar active solutions. Um, and then we need to remind ourselves that these things can't just be energy efficient and cost effective, but they have to be desirable. I mean, that you have to, we have to create things that people want to live in, so they have to be livable. Um, and then because we're building out of concrete, why have to make the decision, do I live in the city and have no garden or live in the suburbs and be able to get my hands dirty and have a green thumb? And so we put gardens on the roof. We're not in the belief that that's going to solve our food problems, um, but it, it's a step in reminding people of where our food comes from. It builds good, strong communities. It's a good generation gap builder where you get seniors teaching people you know, how to grow tomatoes. Um, so we are a certified B Corporation. How many people here know what a B Corp is? All right, well, um, C Corporations, let's start there, are by law obligated, if I'm a director of a C Corporation, I'm obligated to maximize shareholder value, which means that if I want to do something good for the environment, like put solar panels on the roof, and you're my shareholders, and you are only interested in maximizing your financial return, you can sue me and kick me out of my company if I've publicly traded or if um, I have investors with rights like that. So what B corporations do is they write into their bylaws that yes, we're a for-profit company, but we reserve the rights as directors to look out for these other stakeholders namely the environment and the community in which we develop in. So our investors are looking for not only a for-profit return, they're, they want to make market rate risk-adjusted returns, returns just like anyone else, but they're also interested in impact. And I've seen signs around uh, K-State here talking about impact, and it's really these people are high net worth individuals that have realized, I can't take this money with me, and I'd like to make a positive impact with it. And so they are measuring us equally on what we're doing to make the planet better as much as what we're doing to uh, give them a profitable return. Um, so as a B Corporation, uh, and everyone in this room is responsible for some aspect of the built environment, and when 70% of our carbon footprints in our urban areas come from buildings, we have a moral obligation to take this really seriously. Um, you know, when I first read about this was 1998, came across a newspaper article and it talked about how the tundra was melting. And I kind of thought, well, that's weird. Um, you know, the tundra is, should be permafrost, permanently frozen. And over the time from there to now, what we found is the scientists that were seeing these early signs um, had it totally, unfortunately, they had it totally right. And not only is it happening, but it's happening at a faster pace than anyone ever thought it was happening. Uh, we've already reached one degree, and two degrees temperature raise is inevitable. There is practically no physical way that we can stop a two degree rise. So we've got Hurricane Sandy and Katrina with one degree rise. We have droughts. Florida is flooding weekly. If you've seen, they're building pumps to pump out parts of Florida that every high tide, water comes out of the sewer. 
and you think about what is the impact on infrastructure costs that we can't spend on schools and education, and that's just at one degree. So if we go to two degrees, the question is, can we hold it from going to four? And that's largely our company's goal, is to take part in holding it at four. Um, we're, we're an interesting species in that we evolved responding to lions that were in front of us, right? There's a lion in the road, you freak out, you run into your cave. Um, climate change, there's no evolutionary history in our brains to prepare us for this. This is a threat that's 20 years out. Maybe now it's five years out. Um, so, but fortunately we've got this prefrontal thing up here that we can actually think logically about it and say, what impact do I want to leave on the planet uh, for our kids and our relatives? So, another uh, issue is income inequality. Um, if we don't have a strong middle class, we can't build buildings for them. Um, I think the fact that this video, if you haven't seen it, Google Wealth Inequality in America is staggering. Um, and it really shows you, uh, probably gives some window into what's happening politically as well, that our middle class is really, really pressed. Um, so Tim mentioned that we've done work with the United Nations. And about halfway through my Arnold Imaging, Arnold development career, I got a phone call from a guy named Bill Becker who said, um, we'd like you to help us address this issue around climate change, mainly in that people are really depressed and feel that there's nothing that they can do. And so we went around the world. Uh, UN asked us to talk to their experts and find out what are the solutions that are ready to scale. They're cost effective. We know they're out there. But let's start talking about the positive things we could be doing as opposed to just scaring the pants off of people with movie after movie after movie um, talking about how we're uh, going to cook the planet and all going to die. So what we found out while working with the UN was that we have all the solutions we need. That's the good news. And if you remember nothing else from my talk, go away knowing that all the solutions exist. That's the good news. All we have to do is put them together. And for those who believe that climate change is a big hoax, um, Let's create a better world <laughs> anyway, because it's a smart thing to do. Um, but we're not going to get there if we can't make money while doing it. That's just a reality, you know, it's, a, it's just a fact of reality. That in order for things to scale, they have to be profitable. They don't have to be 30% return profitable, but there's not enough grant money and philanthropy to solve climate change. And so you could do one great building and fund it with 30% grant money. And then the question is, is, how do you do the next one? And so we set out to build a model that does not require grants and could be funded with off-the-shelf financial tools that other people can develop. Um, part of the way that we get the cost down is we stop thinking in silos. So as as a species, we love to think in silos. If I'm a developer, I'm just doing housing and that's it. But really, we're in the energy, energy sector. We affect food, we affect transportation, and density makes transit work. Rooftops help solar become more cost effective. And so companies that say, I'm only in solar, they need to go buy land. But developers that say, I'm in housing and in solar, they don't need to buy land, they have a free roof. And so these things, when you combine them into systems, they begin to work better, which is also the core of Passive House. So uh, we looked at reducing household expenditures through sustainable development. First thing you do is get people out of their cars. We spend more on cars than we do on food, which is crazy. 21% of our income compared to 19%. Imagine if we could drop that in half and actually get food that was good for us. Um, second, we don't think we should gentrify the whole neighborhood. So while we're building all this great market rate housing, let's put 20% of it in and make it workforce housing, income qualified so the people who work in the coffee shops, work in the pharmacies, have a place to live and they don't have to drive for hours in. So we're not creating another problem, gentrification, than trying to solve that in 15 years. We're just baking in 
uh, affordability. Passive house, the best way to explain that is putting a sweater around a building, or um, instead of building really skinny walls and a big air conditioner that runs all the time, build thick walls and a tiny air conditioner that hardly, hardly ever runs. And so we've been able to get our energy consumption down from $119 a month on average to 26. Um, and so we came back from the UN work in Rio in 2012 and said, okay, let's stop talking about it. We've learned all these great things we should be doing. We happen to own four acres in the river market. Let's just build it. Let's put together every single idea that's ready to scale that we should be doing. And we called it Second in Delaware. We have a kind of habit of naming all of our developments based on the streets uh, that they're, they're located at. It makes it easy to find. Um, and this project is 276 units. It's transit oriented. The streetcar, which is the orange line, uh, stops a block and a half from the project. Um, it's passive us certified and 20% workforce housing. Uh, following the Hotel Bel Nord model, uh, we decided to make it a courtyard-shaped uh, building and stair-stepped the building so that the southern edge was four stories, stepped up to five and six on the north. And the benefit there was um, bring more uh, sunlight into the courtyard um, and give great views of the skyline from the, the north side of the building. Um, the idea of the roofs, one of the roofs is kind of a dinner, have drinks, sit by a fire pit and look at the sunset and the other is a, you know, get your hands dirty and plant some vegetables and, and uh, get to know your neighbor. And we also have a solar array on the sixth floor, produces about 192 kW a year. Um, pretty standard amenities in the space, so we've got... Uh, a kind of release valve for people with small kids. They can take their kids down and uh, have a place to meet other parents. If you work at home, there's a shared conference room. Uh, the whole building's wired with Google Fiber, so there's a lot of people that uh, do work at home. Uh, we made the building fit into the warehouse uh, aesthetic of the neighborhood. Uh, this is the four-story side overlooking uh, Second Street. And then the courtyard, the idea here is to sort of redefine the backyard and create series of outdoor rooms. This courtyard is, is massive. Um, and so rather than just create one big space, we've created three spaces that you can uh, have little soft places to fall and uh, shade structures you can cook under and, and eat. And then there's a pool that's on the bluff and you can swim uh, in the pool and overlook the, the river. Um, and you see it from the river as you're entering the city. Interior design is pretty straightforward. It's a kind of loft, modern aesthetic, uh, exposing the concrete, polishing the floors, um, clean lines. So we compared this building to another high-rise building that was being built in Kansas City. Uh, it, it finished in 2015. Um, their building's 277,000 square feet. Ours is 321,000. And Theirs needs 40 million kilobtus to be heated, powered, and cooled. And ours needs five. Um, and that's energy at the site. But what we learned with, from our passive house consultants is that you really need to look at total energy. It's not just energy at the site that matters, but it's energy at the power plant that really is the climate change uh, impact. So we have a natural gas turbine in our garage. And what that does is we take natural gas, we burn it in a turbine, it creates electricity. The heat that comes off of the exhaust heats all of our domestic hot water, in essence, for free. So we make more efficient use of the fuel. If you're at a power plant, a coal power plant, and you want one kilobtu of electricity at the site, you need to burn three because two parts of it go up the stack in heat. So the real comparison of these two buildings is 122 million BTUs of coal at the power plant compared to 12.6 uh, for our project, which is a 90% reduction in energy consumption, consumption which uh, truthfully, in our opinion, is the type of 
reduction in energy consumption that we need to make if we're going to make a dent on climate change. Because we can't do this on all the existing buildings, but we really need to take advantage of every new building that we build and uh, go as deep as we can. From a design standpoint, we started off with a really efficient garage. People are still going to drive in Kansas City. That's uh, not changing anytime real soon. And then we put the building directly on top of the building, uh, of the garage, and made sure that none of the columns that were in the units needed to change or use a transfer beam to get into the garage. And so just I, the, the key of all this is, is having the engineering disciplines talk to one another to make sure that we're avoiding unnecessary costs as much as possible. Um, the wall assembly is a concrete sandwich wall that's 16 inches thick. So the inside width is six inches of concrete, then we have six inches of foam, and then we have four inches of concrete. And the foam's in the middle of the wall, so like the Pantheon, for a very long time, it's not going anywhere, it can't be dinged or ripped off the building. Um, and it gives you a complete non-thermally bridged continuous sweater on the whole building, which is ideal for passive house. It's a standard six inch non-post tension slab using just standard rebar. So there isn't any complex uh, you know, crews or uh, know-how needed to put this together. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we modularize the building so that we have this one element, this L, that repeats 20 times in the whole thing. So this goes up six stories. And we have formwork that matches just this L, and we use it. We mirror it to build the other part of the building, and we mirror that to build the rest of the building. Um, so we're all familiar with the design, bid, build model. Does that sound familiar, that an owner hires an architect, has an idea, I want to build this great building, comes up with a big stack of sheets this big, they send it out to bid to, let's say, three contractors. Those three contractors send it out to maybe 100 subs. The subs are all asked to give a firm, hard bid that I'm going to do that electrical for X number of dollars. And what happens? We get all the numbers in. It's over budget. And then we start VEing to get back into budget, which means we're throwing out all the nice things. The windows are gone. The concrete's gone. The passive house is gone. We get back to a building that is an energy hook. So what lean construction has found out is that you really need to turn that on its head. Because the people who know how to build a cost-effective, high-performance building are the guys that are actually building it. They're the guys with the, and the gals with the dirt under their fingers that show up with hard hats on and know all the mistakes and all the things that go wrong. So in lean, you use what's called target value design. As opposed to waiting to the end to come up with your dollar amount, the developer says, he opens the kimono, if you will, and says, I can spend this amount on the building. In our case, it was $42 million. We needed to be passive house, 276 units. And at the time, I think we had a pool in the courtyard. Um, those were our conditions of satisfaction. We then hire the GC based on competence and character, not on bid, not on lowest price. And we say, your ticket into here is that you go open book with us. There's no hidden numbers. You show us all of your costs, true costs, materials, labor, and equipment. No markup. And we then select the subs using the same criteria, competence and character. So now we have a team, electrician, plumber, drywaller, concrete guy, and a GC. And we come in and we say, OK, we would like to do this project for $42 million. Can you validate this cost? And they say, you mean that's all we got to do? I don't need to bid 10 jobs to get one, and they love it. We also needed to all sign NDAs because they're going to open up their true costs to us. And what we did is we went from $55 million to $45 million in six weeks. $10 million flew off the project, and we brought the building in line. We raised our what we could spend by $3 million, and uh, we're able to to close on the project. So um, at the core of this is really turning around who's driving the bus. It's no longer the architect does everything and then it's built. 
It's really a collaborative process where the subs are telling the architect this is the most efficient way to design the building. Um, part of it is also is question everything. So every one of the subs that came to the, this team said, oh, I've got a system I've used for years. And we all gathered around and said, is it the best one? Because one of the things that happens in this lean team is that all of these subs take their profit and they fix it. You validate the cost at 45 million. We add 7% on for their overhead, 4% on for their profit. And then all of those people pool the 4% into one pool. So if the project goes over budget, goes to 46 million, every single one of those subs is losing money. It doesn't matter who did it. So if the plumber goes over, the electrician's hurting. So the electrician is looking always to help the plumber and help the concrete guy and help the HVAC guy, which is unheard of on a job site. If you've ever been to a job site, they all, they don't care, right? They just want to load the floor with as much of their equipment as possible so no one else can get in there. And then they do their work and they get out. They, I don't care what other people's costs are. I mean, the, the games that, that happen are unbelievable. Um, so everyone's questioning everything. We questioned the, the shoring system. And we said, the one you want to use, we saw this video, it takes 36 minutes, and they're not even half set up. But this one out of Germany, they're, they're done. Can we look at that? And there's a lot of pushback you get, but eventually uh, we got the, them to look at it. And not only that, but it was one quarter of the shoring po posts that are needed. And so on a project that you have to move all these shores, if you have one quarter of the equipment, that's just a tremendous labor savings. We also learned that through our lean consultants that tower cranes are the ultimate bottlenecks. So a bottleneck is something that everyone has to wait on, and it makes a job site incredibly inefficient. But we love them because we think, I want the biggest crane, it could pick up the biggest thing, but everyone's waiting on it. And it just slows the schedule down and it drives cost up. So what we did is we had these elevators uh, and we wrapped the typical L. So each small crew has their own little hoisting system and they're not waiting on the tower crane. Um, Synchro modeling is something that you are probably learning about here in, in school, but if not, it's taking the BIM and merging it with a Gantt chart. So Gantt charts are pretty sterile and boring and put people to sleep. This way, the, all of the trades and the subs who make the schedule, by the way, have a way of visualizing where they should be each day. And so each week, you're able to know where your trade partners are going to be so that you're not on top of each other. Um, and you also make sure that you can get all your equipment back out um, you don't end up with a cement truck stuck in the middle of the building that you can't get out of your site. Um, first run studies are really huge if you're trying to do a building like this. And our goal was to bring it in, remember, profitable. We can't, it doesn't work if it takes an extra 20% to get this thing done. And so the way you do anything new is you take a small piece of it and you bring people together and you ask them to do a mock-up do a study, time it. We've outlawed the words per square foot out of our vocabulary because it is a really poor way to describe cost. You should always be talking about labor, equipment, and materials. And when you talk about labor, it's time to do a task. How many minutes does it take to put up that thing? Because no, we don't work in square feet. We work in pieces. Um, and so we convinced all the contractors after it took some work uh, to get in a warehouse and to build this fragment of the building um, several times and see what we could learn. And because the idea is that as opposed to working in what's called a parade of trades where you have a small crew that starts at one corner and eventually after about a week they get back to the beginning, we want to break it up into cells because cells are the most efficient way to work from a lean construction standpoint. So we're going to break this 17,000 square feet into eight different cells, and all of them are working simultaneously. So with the tower crane moving big pieces of formwork that we all see on a project, that takes five weeks to do the walls. And then you can pour the deck. 
Using cells, you get the walls done in one day. That's a massive schedule change and labor savings and you can do a lot more foam and better windows if you're not spending five weeks of labor doing the same task. Um, so we work through the steps, you put the forms, then you have the pre-tied wall steel, and then within an hour later you have the foam, then there's an outer mat of steel, then there's outer foam, forms that go on and your walls are done, as opposed to literally five weeks waiting on a tower crane to pull these big gang forms that you can't move by hand. Um, and then the shoring goes on and you get the deck buttoned up and our cycle is every six days we pour one of these floors as opposed to every six weeks. Um, so what I wanted to do is also show you this is what we learned, this is what we did at the mock-up. So we took four guys, two carpenters, a laborer, and an iron worker, and most of the time those trades don't work together. Most of the time iron workers, they only touch rebar. Carpenters only touch formwork. And the laborer, they only clean. We got all the uh, business associates, the BAs for the unions together, and we said we want all these guys to work together, and we want iron workers to touch forms, we want carpenters to tie iron, and we're going to create a lot more jobs for the unions. And they said, okay. And <laughs> literally everyone on our team was telling us uh, they're never going to do it. They're never going to do it. And, but what they realize is that if they don't do this, people won't hire a union because these work rules that prevent people from working together in a fast fashion are uh, driving up cost and creating a lot of craziness. So this is in hours. Um, so after 10 hours, the walls are done, and then uh, they moved over, and this is how the deck goes up. So we, we found these gravity-fed conveyors that can help move the formwork. They typically use them in a warehouse, and I said, well, let's use them on the job. Instead of having to lug these forms from the scaffold in, they're, they're about 80 pounds each, let's just uh, push them onto the job site. It's like a gigantic gurney, and we can raise the forms up, and we won't tire out the guys. Um, and they said, okay, let's give it a shot. Worked like a charm. The nice thing is crazy. When those things are curved and you push a form along it, it actually just tracks right along the curve. And it, you'd think it would fly off, but it doesn't. So we just finished that about a month ago, and we're about to now go live on the... Um, on the job site. And what we did here was we documented what we learned. And this is what's called an A3 in lean speak. And so the, the thing is, is, is standardizing work. Because if it's not standardized, people are gonna go out and they're gonna do it however they wanna do it, and then you can't measure it, and you can't really get, you can't improve upon it. So we went into 3D Studio Max and animated what we did in the warehouse and created, literally, it's gonna be a small flip book that all these guys have in their back pocket and says your target time for this task is 50 minutes and then we're gonna have a flat screen in the construction office that says how each crew is doing and create some healthy competition and get them to kind of gamify uh, the construction process. And so this is basically just learning everything and we're still documenting it um, and it looks like our goal is shooting down about 6.7 hours to do the walls. Uh, which is really thinking about construction like manufacturing as opposed to thinking about it like building. And if we want to uh, solve climate change, we have to build a better mousetrap, and we have to do it with using our brains and borrowing from the car industry, ironically, um, because they've learned a lot of these lessons a long time before us. We're still trying to get our iron worker to contemplate uh, pre-tying the beams and flying them in. They, they're telling us that this is impossible. And I love it when someone tells me something's impossible because I, I'm relentless and I, I keep pushing and pushing. Um, so I know that we are getting uh, short on time, I think, and I want to save some time for questions. Um, we've got some gate teams. Uh, we've got window tests we did. We blew 150 miles an hour and a boatload of water at it. 
Uh, it held great, uh, so we have no concerns about the windows. Uh, we're coming in at $80 a square foot as opposed to $84 for stick. Um, and if we can do this and show to the institutional investors that are buying apartments by the truckload that you can have a better building for less money that'll last a lot longer, our subversive goal is to transform the industry by making people more money by doing it. Um, and so total life cycle cost, we're about a 19% lower life cycle cost because we've got less maintenance, less painting, lower utility bills. Um, so there's a bunch of benefits, flexible, better land use, lower energy, lower first cost and lower total life cycle costs. Um, again, I mentioned we use just standard financing tools. So a HUD 221 D4 loan, uh, it's off the shelf, anyone can do it. It takes a little bit of brain damage. It took us about 18 months to get, but it's 40 year debt, non-recourse, fixed rate interest at three and a half percent. So it's worth it. Um, and Berkshire Hathaway became our equity partner and uh, they're a great partner to have. They have an appetite for doing a lot of this. Um, and now we're scaling the model. We're looking at uh, a couple different sites to be able to do about 1,500 units in Kansas City over the next uh, three to five years. Um, and again, I go back to the beginning part, which is like how I got here. Part of it was just opening my eyes to seeing problems around me that I would like to solve that had something that held my interest. And so I found my calling in the newspaper, you know, reading about climate change, reading about isolated latchkey kids that needed to have better places to grow up. Um, and in looking back, I'm halfway through the 27 year plan, we're near 13 right now. A um, Couple thoughts on keys to success. One is don't quit. This is not easy. I, it looks easy, right? Anyone can show a bunch of slides, but as my wife can attest, there's flaming arrows every week. We have subcontractors that fall down. We have people that don't do what they say they're gonna do. It's a journey. And the key is just don't quit. Wake up every day and say, we'll solve this. And you do, you figure out a way, even when it looks completely bleak. Um, so with that, I think I'll open it up for questions. We have. The, one of the tenets of Passive House is a super tight envelope. And so when you prefab the walls, you increase the number of joints tremendously. And a lot of these tapes and glues, and it's just, it's too new to know like how long is it gonna last. And so that's largely what drove us away from these assemblies that require or depend on you know, a lot of uh, tape and goo. Yeah. Um, a lot of the problems that we face with climate change is the construction process. And I know you said earlier, well, it's your goal to eventually you know, go back to these, these slum cities. And um, I know steel and concrete pick up about 8% of our carbon emissions during production, and I noticed that's most of your buildings. Have there been any thought into a cleaner construction process or alternative building materials? I know there's projects done in Minnesota where they try to do like zero net waste during mm -hmm. the construction process. Can you speak to any of those points? Sure, so you're absolutely right. The carbon footprint is higher than wood. It's dramatically less than steel. Um, when you have a 90% reduction in operational costs, it makes your carbon you know, your carbon positive uh, you know, investment um, a blip when you look at it over 100 years. Um, there's an argument going on right now, like, well, should we be front loading making that carbon investment now when we're teetering? Or should we be looking at like cross-laminated timber and these other things? And, and my take is, let's do both. Cross-laminated timber is wonderful, but the codes aren't ready for it at scale. Um, we don't really know if we have enough forest to, to use it at scale. Um, and so I think we need the concrete industry to clean up their act. They could do a lot better. You know, they theoretically, if you look at Amory Levins, they, they can cut their carbon footprint by 75%. Um, so we're 
pushing them, when we speak to them, we, that's the last slide we leave them with, is uh, Amory Levins is, hey, your potential to reduce, keep going. Um, so I, I think you need to look at it. MIT is taking a look at our entire Revit model and looking at all of the carbon footprint of you know, the embodied energy. And then, so we'll be able to report on that. But from a high level, it, the energy side of things is really the bigger thing to go after. Let me just remember from economics the old adage of supply and demand, right? Those simple curves of when demand drops, price drops, right? So everyone's anticipating that there will be a significant correction on those homes that are on the periphery that, you know, aren't in high demand. And that probably they will be, unfortunately, where immigrant families that have larger families will find an affordable place to settle. Um, I say unfortunately because it saddles them with pretty high transportation costs, which uh, is outstripping wage increase, which means that they've got more to deal with. Do you think they could become truck farms and food production belts? Or Sure. I mean, eventually. No education centers. Or? Yeah. The eventually, I think that it's in the short term, the demand will drop as our population's you know projected to grow 100 million over the next 50, 60 years. I think that the demand will come back up. Um, it's interesting to look at how long a single-family suburban house lasts, but it's only designed to last 15, 20 years. You know, by if you look at the construction type and how much money homeowners pour into their investment to make them last 80, 100 years. Um, you know, I think adapting some of these technologies to how we do different scales is, is completely applicable. It doesn't all have to be 250 units. You know, you could, you could build 20, you can build a townhome out of the same technology, but just make things that last and are flexible. You mentioned a lot about our social exposure of climatic issues that have impacted um, the way that you approach construction in that business. Um, how do you how do you uh, anticipate uh, things like uh, the technological singularity and uh, automation? How does that um, impact your business model? Well, I have to admit, I'm I'm not really familiar with technological singularity, but I'd love to know about it. Um, the technological singularity is the idea that as technology gets more advanced, eventually it'll reach a point where we don't have limits on our, the things that we can, we can do with technology. Yeah, I think that this is kind of a step in that, because if you look at our solution, it's, it's, a, it's adapting and, and really stealing from the best of technological solutions in the construction industry across the board, right? From Jane Jacobs to Passive House. Um, to DOCA. So, and we live in a world right now where you can find all this stuff on YouTube. I mean, literally, there, we're reaching that point where the knowledge is not hidden away in some subcontractor's world that only he or she knows what can be used. And we're driving them a little nuts, but I, I think we're, we're reaching that. And the more that we can I don't know if it's the same idea, but it's... I meant more like, um, in terms of the, the impact on uh, the people that are going to be inhabiting the building, how do you, 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 you could, like you were talking about, like the poor people over in South Africa, these people are struggling because they don't have the infrastructure to give them the opportunities to uh, prop themselves up in the way that we do. Right. Um, when we're projecting that we're losing some of the biggest uh, job markets out there. You're talking about... 25%, 50% of the job market in the near future is, is potentially going to be uh, taken over by uh, machines. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious what you're talking about. I have a lot of hope that we're scaling up uh, as, as the machines do our base needs, that hopefully Maslow's hierarchy, that we can all climb up a rung on the ladder, and as opposed to having to be digging the ditch, we can be studying music and selling that and actually 
you know, having commerce be things that maybe are less material, but we value. Um, I think that there's a lot of strength around uh, building shelter that lasts, that's secure, getting those needs met, and then allowing people to really focus on community, the arts, and, and I don't think we've even really begun to tap that. It's going to require a revolution on our education system and just how we prioritize what success is, because it's no longer a basement full of plastic stuff from China. You know, it's, it's something else. Um, but that's a, a challenging, you know, what we strive to achieve. Um, but I think that needs to be done as well. Yes. Could you elaborate on your process for researching that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it, it wasn't as scientific as one would think. It was kind of based on first principles, kind of stepping back and saying, if you're going to build a building, make it last, because it's not just the, sh the structure that's in there, but you've got flooring, and you've got tile, and you've got drywall, and you have all this stuff that if water gets in, and we've seen it so much in Kansas City, all these merchant builders come in, they put up these stick buildings, and within three years, there's a whole crew and a lawsuit, and they're stripping the windows and, and, and the whole facade off. So we just sort of said, let's build something that's longer lasting and achieve passive house. And the keep it simple, stupid, sorry, you know, uh, adage of KISS is, or Mockham's razor, whatever the term is, right, the easiest solution, Concrete just really rose above because of the, the nature of it, right? You, you pour it, it gels all in place and creates practically a joint-free, thermally bridge-free shell that with column spacing at, at 28 feet, you can use it for anything. And you look at great cities and those, call them background buildings, cities with great background building, buildings or neighborhoods like Dumbo or uh, parts of Brooklyn that, you know, that, that have utilized these warehouses. They were warehouses in the beginning, they changed to something else, now they're housing, mixed use. It just seemed to be logical. But we are now going back and calculating that. We have looked at the embodied energy of concrete versus all the savings we have on the energy side and said, right now, that, that solved that question for us so we don't stay up at night freaking out about our carbon footprint on concrete. So my question would then be, uh, you know, when built and uh, before built, you're, you're obviously, uh, you know, have tenants and that sort of thing. So. Um, is, is this a case where you will uh, sell this asset to someone else who will manage, manage it, or will you work with somebody to manage an asset you hang on to? I mean, on the one hand, you have many assets because you've got the BIM model, and you've got all that that could be, right. a, that right. could, could be a saleable item, as well as, as you say, the, the life cycle cost. Yep. So where, what's your thought moving forward? In Great. That regard? Is, it, is there a fourth company in your Great question. So um, remember the income inequality slide? Um, that I'm, I'm, I'm not a believer in Piketty, the economist, solutioned income inequality, but I do believe he hit the nail on the head when he looked at what's the root cause of it. And Piketty, French uh, economist that came out with this tome of a book about a year ago that blew up um, you know, the eco economist debate, uh, economic debate of of what is the cause of income inequality. And he basically said that if the rise of private equity, the rate of increase of private equity, exceeds the increase in GDP, there's only one thing that'll happen. You'll have income inequality because private equity is largely inherited. And if it's growing faster, it's gotta come from somewhere. It's gotta come off of labor. And so this great sucking sound to the 1% is largely driven by the fact that private equity is getting a 15 to 25% IRR, depending on if you're in real estate or shale gas plays. And your average Joe and Jane is getting a 2% increase in their wage. So 
what we did some thought on is how do we get your average person getting the same returns that the private equity group does? And so our solution there is to use private equity to finance the construction. And then after they're built, the renters can have the opportunity to buy the shares from basically step into the shoes of the private equity folks. Their money comes back out. We use that money to build the next building. And they then are getting a dividend and have a redefined ownership and equity in the building. So that after the debt's paid off, their rent is simply taxes and maintenance. Um, but if they want to move, they don't have to pay a broker fee, so they're not losing equity there. Uh, if they want to change units, they're not having to sell their unit before they can move. They can just move. Um, there's a tr and you don't have the condo nightmares of a board that doesn't know how to manage real estate putting art in the elevator and not tuck point in the building, which is what happens. Don't buy a condo, ever. Like, don't. Um, buy REIT stock and rent, and that way you can sell it and you'll get a better return. Um, so that's our, our, added, our, our mission there is to then scale this up so that imagine whole neighborhoods of inner city communities that have been renting generationally, owning the equity in their apartment. No landlord can kick them out, can raise the rent. If they do raise the rent, they just get a higher dividend. And if they don't like the way the landlord's managing the building, they can fire them because it's a REIT. Everyone has a share and a vote. So that's kind of our next step, subversive, like attack the, you know, the realtor industry is going to hate us, but I, you know, they make more than, than architects. It's nuts. It's crazy. They just opened the door. So I, I'm not losing any sleep on realtors needing to change their business model. Yes? Uh, given the lack of legal background and insurance background, IPD contracts, are you getting any kickback from designers or construction from using that type of delivery method? Um, no. And the reason I, I say that is that we selected our team based on competence and character. And the only way you can know competence and character is if you have a relationship with them. And trust is really the currency that drives IPD. So you can have a document. My father always told me, he said, you know, any legal document is only as good as the person who signed it. So we basically took the consensus docs 300, which is the boilerplate. It's labeled as the most fair and balanced IPD contract. And we just signed it. We didn't change a darn thing. We said, it's all plain language. Makes sense. Let's do this. And it's all, all for one, one for all, right? We're all locked arms. And if there's cost overruns, we're all feeling the pain. So far, so good. You know, we'll, we'll know at the end of the project if the thing goes down in flames and people start suing each other. But I think that the people that we're working with, um, they do the right thing even when it hurts. And by my book, that's the definition of character. Is what do you do when no one's watching or when it's difficult? And, you know, if, you're, if you know the person for a long time, they're not going to try the crazy stuff because they're more interested in the relationship. And all of these guys are interested in the next 10 projects because our promise to them is no sports team repicks their, their team on Monday morning. I mean, that just doesn't happen, right? You'd have to relearn your plays. It would be a, a nightmare. But in the construction industry, we do that on every project. And we think that going out to bid is going to get us the lowest price. All it does is the guy who's got the lowest bid has found the biggest change order. And hole in the drawings, because no set of drawings is complete. Just can't be. So let's let the IPD team draw the building, direct it, and everyone says, all right, let's do this. No crazy change order stuff, and we're all looking out. And it takes the friction out of the process, because if you try to do lean without IPD, Human nature sets in, and people just end up solving for their own bottom line, not the whole teams. Yes? So first of all, every, that was absolutely incredible, I oh. think. And the fact that you, you visualize the, the, the construction process as well as, it, as, as well as the end result, I think, is a much more impactful use of visualization. Mm. Um, and, but I'm just wondering, as far as your model goes, you said that you select and work with the subcontractors. So I'm sure there's a reason, but then why do you need the general contractor? 
So you're gonna, you're not gonna select all of your subcontractors to be in the IPD team, just your major ones. Okay. So in our case, it was drywall, concrete, plumbing, mechanical, electrical. Like the dude who's doing the, the fencing or the steel stairs or the doors, the cabinets, you still need a CM to do that, but their role is significantly reduced. And so what's happened on some IPD teams is if the CM, because CMs normally what they do is they find the dumb guys and beat them up. That's, that's CMs MOs, is they, they hold them to a contract, they, they force a schedule that the, that the sub didn't make into their contract, and when they go over, they hit them with LDs, and it's just a confrontational nightmare. And so what's happened in IPD is these subs get together and the, the power of the CM gets reduced and they can't do that anymore. And so the, the bad behaviors go away and what largely gets replaced on healthy IPD teams is a tremendous amount of respect and kind of all the things that our parents told us we should do if we wanna be good people, you know, like don't keep record of wrongs, be patient, don't be proud. All those traits come out on an IPD team because um, there's a certain amount of humility that comes with it, right? You, you realize we're on a journey to improve as opposed to I know it all. It never gets you elected president, so. so uh, <clears throat> I really want to thank you very much, Todd. That was great. And I'm sure that you would be willing to take individual questions as well. But uh, uh, that, it, I think you said it really great. Um, it was an IDP, IPD lecture, actually. Mm. Uh, very, very well done uh, in terms of uh, uh, showing it both from uh, uh, visualization all the way to thinking through how it's manifested. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.